Hi, everyone. Welcome back to our podcast from the Kama Sutra to 2020, where we look at your questions, your concerns, even your worries around all things to do with sex and sexuality. Today, we don't have with us Dr. Anvata Madan Behel, but in her place, we have the beautiful, the one and only Lisa Mangaldas. Lisa is one of my favorite people, one of these amazing ladies on social media. She's on Instagram. She is a sex positive content creator and has become a really important voice in trying to normalize and raise awareness around women's pleasure. And Lisa, it is an absolute delight to welcome you here. Thank you so much. That was such a kind introduction and it is entirely my honor, Seema, to be here. Thank you. Lisa, um, so this is obviously for everybody out there, this is, um, you can see it's a mutual admiration society. We both love each other. Um, but Lisa, I'm over here today to talk to you about something very specific. Hundreds and hundreds of emails from women talking about how to explore self-pleasure. So we talk about self-pleasure, that's something that they would like to understand for themselves, they'd like to explore, but they don't really know where to start. And a lot of these people, a lot of these young ladies, a lot of these women have nowhere to go to to ask these questions. So I was thinking maybe between us, we can actually try and make it a little bit easier for them. So let's talk about orgasms. <laughs> I'd love that. You know, I was also very much that young woman who had no idea um, how to navigate pleasure on my own. I mean, I was really late to the self-pleasure game. Um, I, I think that I uh, probably had my first sexual experiences around 18 and I only masturbated for the first time at like 27 or 28, you know, so somehow <laughs> I had just thought for the first time decade of being a sexually active adult that sex was superior to self-pleasure or that somehow you know masturbation was for people who weren't getting any or that it was shameful and that I didn't need to do it I don't know why I had these ideas because I so um I mean I worked so hard to dismantle those ideas but I had them you know we all I mean have to unlearn stuff right and so I feel like for me it was a journey kind of um, navigating my own pleasure myself and I or, and I didn't know that I didn't know I don't know how to explain how profound the discovery was when I finally actually looked at and explored and you know touched myself and used a vibrator for the first time and things like that I didn't know that I didn't know it's so, so you know I went through it could have been one more decade of all my whole life not knowing if you don't know that you don't know <laughs> <laughs> you know, how do you how do you have that awareness? So I feel like it was so um, serendipitous, actually, that um, a funny little chance conversation with I, had a, I have a friend who's bisexual who was living in Mumbai at the time. Sadly, she's not here anymore. And anyway, anyway, so she had um, had a, a, a girlfriend for a very long time. And then that relationship ended up not working out. And after sort of being single and kind of healing and everything she was like I'm ready to date again and I think I'm gonna try dating men it's been so long since I've been with a guy and so you know let's let's get back on the dating market and she she was on a dating app and things and then she reported back to me like a few uh, uh, sometime later about some of um, the experiences she's had she's had on uh, with straight men and she was just like oh my gosh I don't know how you straight women do it you know, I forgot how much men need to be schooled. Why would I bother having casual sex with a man when I have a vibrator? It's literally like taking bus when you have a Ferrari. So <laughs> I was like, really? <laughs> the way she said it, um, you know, it was just the, the joy in her eyes when she said my vibrator. I was like, I am missing out on something here. I never even knew um, that it was this thing that people actually use you know I thought vibrators were like novelty items that you give to some friend on their bachelorette party or buy as a joke and that no one really uses them and they're just they're silly you know unfortunately they're presented to us in the mainstream as some sort of frivolous item maybe in other countries the perception has evolved but I think in India still there's like this sense that vibrators are some sort of stupid funny ridiculous item um, that you kind of buy as a joke or that's I don't know, kinky, and I don't know why it unfortunately still remains seen in this light. 
Uh, but my friend was like, you know, you, you don't have a vibrator, like you're so sex positive and everything. Why don't you have one? And they had to get here, unfortunately. Right. But we did some Googling and we found, you know, that you can buy them online here and we ordered one. <laughs> And then um, when it and and when when I use and we tried to go for the best quality I could afford and really did the research did the you know there's like in any product category there's toys and there's toys and some are better than others and if you are purchasing one I feel like it's best to go for something that you've read about you know do at least as much research as you would before buying a toaster or a washing machine or something right read the reviews <laughs> I feel like it helps too because pleasure can be so varied and what you like might be a little different from what someone else likes so it's nice to try and find a pleasure product that sounds like it's gonna be fun for you to use right and there's so much out there so we like spent a lot of time reading about different products available and then decided on one that had great reviews and provides both clitoral and vaginal stimulation simultaneously like no human can <laughs> no I mean but anyway so we, we we just bought it and when I when I used it for the first time it was such a revelation and you know I, I don't think that a pleasure product can ever compete with a human being I think it's very unfortunate that men particularly seem very threatened by vibrators like oh my god you know if all women have vibrators then what's going to happen to us and it's not like that I mean yes I think the trade-off on um, a casual sexual encounter when the only reason for two people to meet is sex um, perhaps that trade-off, because of the risk of pregnancy, the risk of, I don't know, unfortunately in our, STDs, in our cetera, society, yeah. and if you're a heterosexual woman in a patriarchal society, you know, what is the worst you fear during an encounter one-on-one -on -one with a man? You fear violence and death. That's the worst I fear, you know? I mean, usually for, for, for a straight man, the worst he fears is rejection. As a woman, you're legitimately concerned about your safety, you know? So unfortunately, while I wish we could just have um, all the casual sex we like these are things we think about so I think um, in that context sure why well, I'd rather stay home with my vibrator than explore um, you know things that might be very disappointing but I think a, a relationship or some sort of and I don't want to actually even I don't mean to put monogamy on a pedestal but whatever if you have a real connection with someone if you have a partner who is your friend and your supporter and a champion of everything you love and even just someone you have um, a shared experience with or share a space with or whatever it is if they add meaning to your life they can't be replaced by a piece of silicone you know and if that's all that the, if the only thing they're providing you with is mediocre sex then I mean are they even what value are they adding really you know so I think this thing of like oh I can be replaced by a vibrator is very silly and I want to dismiss that in fact a vibrator can be like a, a fantastic conspirator there's so much pressure I feel on uh, on partners to perform and to satisfy each other and things like that and I mean simultaneous orgasms are rare and you know it's very normal for people to have different amount, different sort of levels of libido or different um, sort of duration um, till orgasm or you know sometimes maybe you're just like not in the mood to do some things and your partner wants to do another thing and, and I feel like we instead of communicating we feel a lot of pressure you know um, and, and, and pretend and fake. And I mean, there's so many, I think, um, ways in which our communication could improve. And I really think actually that sex toys can be a wonderful aid to make every sexual experience very pleasurable for all, all parties and that it eases the burden, you know? Why should I fake an orgasm? And why should he have to keep going if he's kind of tired now? I think it's a win-win. <laughs> and I love, and you know, we love each other still. It doesn't take anything away. So I'm sorry I went on a tangent, but I did want to clarify that because I think a lot of men feel very threatened every time I talk about how vibrators are great. Um, they think like I'm advocating for, for the demise of like <laughs> the male lover. And that's yeah. not what I'm saying. Yeah, exactly. And also there's toys for people of all genders. You know, there's wonderful sex toys for penis owners. There's gender neutral toys. There's like toys for other parts of the body. And, and really your imagination I feel is such a powerful tool and any toy can be used in different ways. Actually, it's sad that they tend to be categorized as four men and four women on the website or like, you know, um, very sort of narrowly defined in their use. But in fact, you know, you could use a clitoral stimulator for nipple play as well. Or, I mean, this is no, no end to what you can do. It's play, right? They're toys. I love the word toy. I love the idea of play and adding play to your 
um, bedroom experience. And I think that we should just think of them as technology that exists. You know, even a pillow is a form of technology. Like you, back when there were no pillows, like people probably slept on their hands or didn't have a pillow. And now you have a pillow and it's not competing with it. It just makes sleeping more comfortable, right? Technology doesn't have to be electronic. And I think even in the realm of uh, pleasure products, people have had like pleasure aids, even if they were not motorized for millennia, right? You will tell us more about that, I'm sure. Absolutely. And I think that I would, um, I'd like to sort of say that what you just said about how it really adds to the relationship experience, well, the Kama Sutra definitely says that if you have a really good, pleasurable, mutually pleasurable, intimate relationship, then any couple um, who have that sort of love between them should use these pleasure instruments together. Because it just adds to it. Like you said, it takes the, pleasure, uh, the pressure off you, uh, off either partner at any particular time. And it adds variety to it. So, you know, you can stay monogamous, but add variety without actually stepping outside the marriage. And they, re they advocated all sorts of different ways. As a matter of fact, um, the Kama Sutra says that it was really, really important to create a phallus shaped object for your beloved which would pleasure her. So it would be to her liking. And I think it's amazing that the man actually had to learn how to do this. It was a skill that he had to learn to create the phallus for his beloved so that he could pleasure her on, on a, at a time when they were together. I mean, how amazing is that? Yeah, and I think, I mean, that's, I, I, that's so fascinating. And, and I think people, you know, mistakenly believe that sex toys or instruments of pleasure are some sort of new Western invention or something. But there's been a variant of some sort of um, pleasure aid across cultures and for, for centuries, right? But I think it's also- I mean, talking really, about vibrators um, also, sorry, I think I was telling you this story no. earlier that 2000 years ago when Cleopatra had her little egg, she used to have this little wooden egg, highly polished, which was sealed with um, really angry bees. And she would use that. Now, I mean, the thought of it scares me, I'll be honest. But <laughs> the idea is that, yes, the idea of vibrating inside you, I, I, you know, it's not a new thought at all. Even the idea of the vibrations, there were no batteries in her time. So I guess she had to use this. That's so interesting. I'm going to have to look that up. But no, I think it's really wonderful also, um, even beyond just heterosexual relationships, you know, pleasure products can add a whole world of, fun also to queer experiences because um and i think actually uh, often people are less threatened by the idea of a sex toy in a queer relationship because you know if two women or two people with vulvas are, are being intimate you don't see some sort of vibrator or i don't know cylindrical shaped device as a threat or competition it's clearly it's going to be fun for both of you and, 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 and just an addition to the mix. But somehow I feel like we're so penis centric in heterosexual sex and so penetration centric. And somehow the man thinks his, you know, worth is contingent on the size and shape. And I don't know how long his penis lasts, you know, and I really think like um, we should take a lesson from, from queer love uh, and particularly from the fact that the orgasm gap, which kind of shows that, heterosexual women are the least likely to, able, to be able to report that they frequently or always orgasm during sex when compared to heterosexual men, gay men, or gay women, right? And, and, and many women also claim that they're reliably able to orgasm during self-pleasure. So why is it that in all other scenarios, women experience orgasms, but only <laughs> with straight men, there's a big gap. Obviously, there's something happening here. Not that women's orgasms are hard to attain, but rather that the over focus on penetration and the penis isn't really serving anyone, right? I feel like we still define sex, heterosexual sex, like predominantly as penetration and penis has to go into a vagina. But why? Why can't oral sex be the whole event? Why can't, you know, whatever other thing that you both find pleasurable be just as legitimate? as penetration and so many men write to me being like I don't think I have a big enough penis I don't think I last long enough is it okay if um, I sometimes struggle to get an erection I'm so embarrassed you know I think that we don't have enough space I mean I actually think men don't feel comfortable enough being vulnerable publicly so we don't have very many like sex positive cishet male influencers right it's mainly women and que or queer people leading the way and women um, doing this work and sort of trying to unpack sexual shame and talking about pleasure and things like this. But men are 
so abundant in my DMs. I feel like they are yearning for a space in which to be vulnerable, but they've created for each other and for themselves this trap of masculinity where, you know, they don't talk about this stuff openly, but I think if men are were honest, they do also have lots of body insecurities around sex, a huge amount of performance pressure, worry about things like how long, penis size, erection, all of this stuff, I don't know. And I feel like even a, a lot of those concerns could be mitigated, you know, by being, by looking at sex as more than just penetration, by, by re recognizing that you can please your partner in a lot of ways other than just, that have nothing to do with the size <laughs> or duration of your erection. And also that sex doesn't have to end just because you ejaculated, you know, all of these things. So I feel like um, it's, it's really warped regardless of gender or sexual orientation, talking about this stuff so that there's more pleasure for everyone. And, and I think straight women particularly um, given the, that the orgasm gap is so skewed outside of their favor. <laughs> we need to be talking about it, you know? We need to be talking about it and we need to be working towards it because as I've always said, I think, you know, having an orgasm does such amazing things for your, for you, for your psyche, for your stress levels, for your blood pressure. It just, it makes everything better. You have a little orgasm, you move on to the rest of the day. It is fantastic. You know, you have it at night, fair enough. You move on for the rest of the day, the next day, and be really, really productive. And it's a good thing. It's it's not a bad thing. It's a good thing to explore. It's a good thing to have. So I agree with you. I think that we should be exploring pleasure. We should be exploring self-pleasure if it can't come from other places. And self-pleasure is not a bad thing. It's not a sinful thing. I get a lot of emails asking if it's a sinful thing to do. Is it a bad thing to do? I even had somebody recently write to me and say that if she is still a virgin, um, will that mean that she will have bad skin? Will she get pimples if she hasn't had sex? And I was just thinking, I mean, not only do we put far too much um, weight on this idea of virginity and uh, what it can do to you, but if you're that concerned that you think that not having sex or not having a sexual partner will give you bad skin, that maybe your hormones will change somehow, then self-pleasure with a, an instrument of pleasure will be the way forward. <laughs> I mean, I think a lot of, you know, there's so many myths around what masturbating or not masturbating or having sex or not having sex is gonna do to you. I don't think masturbation or sex or not having it or anything has anything to do with acne, hair fall, blindness. I don't know, people have all kinds of associations that they want cleared up. Like, will having sex or masturbating cause this, this, and this? Or will not having sex or not masturbating? No, like, no, you're going to be fine. You don't have to have sex. And if you have sex, good for you. It's really up to you, but it's not going to, co you know, it's not going to end up causing this list of like strange other outcomes that, that are really falsely correlated. Um, I think that, I think that uh, it's also important though to just, I mean, I want to just put it out there that, there's no pressure to have sex. There's no pressure to masturbate. There's no pressure for every sexual encounter to result in an orgasm. I don't mean to be prescribing that this is how it should be and this is what you have to do. And this, But I just think there's so much shame kind of come, that we're all burdened with that I just want to reassure you that if you do want to explore or if you do think it might be fun or if you would like to have an orgasm, then by all means, you know, there's nothing inherently wrong with or as you were saying sinful or shameful about pursuing your own pleasure or investigating your own body and exploring all of this stuff so I don't mean to be prescriptive I only mean to try to normalize this you know it's up to each person to decide what they want to or not want to do and also I mean sex doesn't have to be goal oriented if it isn't ending in an orgasm it can it might still have been fun and I feel like you know different people have different differing sort of um, attitudes to what's pleasurable or what they enjoy and for some people even just intimacy might be very pleasurable and they might not enjoy sex as much or I mean there's people who are you know asexuality is also a valid orientation and I feel like it's rendered almost invisible even though there's so much sexual shame I feel like at the same time we kind of have this hypersexual media landscape where we think that something you know you get punished for being a slut but you also get ostracized for being asexual it's, it's ridiculous we shouldn't be punishing any of that right like live and let live I feel is the is the main thing I want people to be able to do. I just think that um, even just having conversations around it, 
are great. I mean, I just think like, like you said, you get punished for almost anything. If you are having sex, if you're not having sex, if you enjoy the pleasure, if you don't enjoy the pleasure, it's just, it's like, this is all bad. This is like the, the pit of hell. This is the black hole from which you will fall through and burn and hellfire forevermore. But to come back to if a woman decides that she is going to explore a little bit of self-pleasure and she's going to come and maybe pick up a, a, an instrument of some kind, what are your bits of advice to start off? Like, what are the things? Can we give a little how to a little brief? Um, yeah, sure. Um, I think, you know, again, I think it's important to just the caveat is that like everybody's the specificities of your arousal and your pleasure may be a little different from mine. But I think there's I mean, the studies that have been done and stuff that kind of suggest that for a lot of people, this kind of thing works or for a lot of people, this type of thing doesn't work. So it from studies around the orgasm gap and stuff like that, it does seem that the clitoris is is kind of neglected and ignored in heterosexual relationships because of this over-reliance on penetration as the definition of sex. And I too definitely um, thought that, you know, that sex is a penis in a vagina or something inside the vagina. And I didn't realize that in fact, you can have only clitoral stimulation and have this magnificent pleasure. In fact, at least for me, and I think this holds true for a lot of people with vulvas, uh, clitoral stimulation is required in order to reliably experience orgasm, whereas like the penetration is optional. It can highly enhance an orgasm. I love the combination of clitoral stimulation and penetration, but penetration without clitoral stimulation is unreliable, <laughs> at least for me. And it seems to be statistically the case for quite a lot, for the majority of women. There are some people who do find only penetration pleasurable. And whatever you, maybe you don't like, clitoral stimulation at all that's fine too so I don't there's no right or wrong way or I'm not saying that this is the only way and this is how you should do it but there's some kind of I mean in in an attempt at making this information available and and, and sort of understandable there's certain generalizations I suppose that researchers have tried to make based on date pools of data and it seems it research suggests and from my own personal experience I can corroborate that it is true for me that Clitoral stimulation is among the most reliable routes to orgasm for people with vulvas. Uh, penetration alone is not sufficient. And so a toy like a clitoral stimulator, which literally has nothing phallic about it, it, it looks like a small, you know, something you can hold in your hand with a little uh, circular nozzle. Um, for me, like that toy was such a revelation because my, my first toy was a dual action toy that I described early on. And it was like a rabbit style vibrator. It was many years ago. It's kind of a crude looking toy, but it has like a phallic insertable end and a small rabbit with vibrating ears that's on the clitoris. And I liked that toy. It was, it was a very uh, fun toy as well, but it was my first toy. I hadn't tried a lot of toys having now ex like, ex you know, I'm, I'm quite the sex toy enthusiast and having tried a bunch of different toys, one of my favorite toys now, is the clitoral stimulator. Um, it's sort of like air suction based. Uh, so there's like a small, the nozzle at the top just provides very targeted stimulation to the clitoris and you're holding it. Um, and it's very comfortable to hold unlike a bullet vibrator or something that the, where the whole thing is just buzzing. I, I, I wouldn't, I didn't personally enjoy having like a very strong vibrating object in my hand. Like that detracted a little bit from the overall experience and I love that with the clitoral stimulation that the vibrator is only acting on the clitoris and the rest of the device is actually quite stable and quiet and so it's a very um it's just doing the right thing at the right place I find it very effective um I think it's also quite fun to use more than one toy at a time another thing that didn't occur to me early on I thought like you use this toy and then you use that toy and like they're each you know to be used individually but in fact using like a non-motorized um, insertable wand, like let's say, you know, there's some really beautiful stainless steel non-motorized wands. Um, there's also, uh, but you know, there's like a, I know people think that glass toys are, ooh, that sounds scary, but there's a, a particular type of borosilicate glass that's very difficult to break and that's, you know, totally non-porous. And I mean, the wonderful thing about uh, glass and steel toys is they can last you a lifetime if you care for them carefully that like, good for the environment you know you're not using batteries or plastic or anything um, and they can be incredibly wonderful tools as well they're like sensitive to temperature you know you could um, put it in cold water or hot water beforehand or whatever if you want to experience temperature play things like that but 
so so for me uh, working with a clitoral stimulator and a non motorized uh, wand together is glorious <laughs> i highly recommend it um and yeah i mean but i think you know i tried so many different toys and then i realized that this combination is just explosive all of them were fun i don't think i mean there's some toys like in as i was saying earlier also with anything like sometimes you get a dud right you might want to buy some i don't know dress that looks beautiful on the website and you get it and like it doesn't fit or there's no pockets or whatever so you might this trial and error for sure you might buy a toy that you think sounds great and maybe it's not as powerful as you thought or maybe the vibrations are too loud or maybe it doesn't it's not as comfortable as you thought like there's definitely i'm not saying every single toy is perfect and i think it's worth giving toys a chance like many people just get one toy they'll go for the cheapest toy and it's kind of dinky and and then like oh this wasn't even so great and then they never buy a toy again i feel like as with anything that you end up enjoying you know even something as simple as food like if you're trying a new food you try sushi for the first time and you happen to go to a sushi restaurant that isn't very good and then you dismiss sushi for the rest of your life you're missing out right so i feel like it's worth like trying a few toys i know i wish they were more affordable and i know they're not easy to access here but i feel like with anything it's a whole world that's worth if you're interested in exploring worth spending time and energy kind of figuring out the good from the not so good and um giving it a chance you know there's a learning curve i feel it's not necessarily instantaneously going to be like you bought yourself the perfect toy and but i feel like when you do i mean it can be quite life altering lots of vulva owners have had their first orgasm using a vibrator or a clitoral stimulator or some sort of pleasure instrument because there is something incredibly effective about the stimulation they're able to provide so i feel like why not embrace this technology you know just like we embrace so, all kinds of technology i totally agree with you i'm 100% with you on that one um okay let's talk about the uh, the little clitoral stimulators the toys that come specifically for clitoral um, stimulation now i know that i mean i would also recommend to people that even you could even use it while you're having sex with a partner and it's just do does two separate things all together you know and it's fantastic together it doesn't take away from your partner men if you're listening out there guys it doesn't take away from you this is just an added thing to add to the excitement of the whole thing but um let's actually talk about how you would use it how would you recommend because it doesn't have to penetrate so i think a lot of women would probably find that an easier thing to use because it doesn't have to be put inside you it can just you, go into uh, the lips right so with clitoral stimulators uh, it's a toy that can be used just externally on the vulva on the clitoris essentially so yeah there's an, i mean there isn't really a part of it that's insertable they, they make some with an insertable end but the classic clitoral stimulator is literally um kind of just like a device with a small handle and a nozzle almost looks like one of those things you could you know those like electronic face cleaning things that has a similar <laughs> similar look sometimes um so it's literally just something you hold and use externally i do think that a lot of sex toys and actually sex in general can be more fun with lube um and with clitoral stimulators maybe you don't need that much lube but it's still fun lube just makes it reduces friction um makes things makes slippery, everything slidey. fun it makes everything fun i think lube is one of the unsung heroes of um of like pleasure and lots of fun to incorporate into solo or partner play um and and i think the other thing i want to just say is that even uh self pleasure with your own hands or you know um exploring things without something that you have to go out and buy or that you don't have access to or can't afford i'm not saying that you need this to explore your self pleasure like by all means please don't wait if you can't access a vibrator and you want to explore your body you know your fingers and um however you like to touch yourself and it's not just the genitals it can be your whole body like you already have fantastic apparatus available to you um without even having to purchase a product so i don't want to make people feel like they need this in order to access the pleasure or something there's a lot you can do with with what you already have um and there's you know it isn't inferior or somehow not as good or something they're just different experiences in fact there can be something quite wonderful about um acoustic <laughs> acoustic self pleasure practice it can sometimes be a more prolonged or sort of slow build up uh rather than the sort of you know quite yeah, well, i definitely i intense agree with you that and one doesn't necessarily quick. 
yeah, no, no, I agree with you. One doesn't necessarily need another instrument, but this is um, in answer to a lot of women asking how to use instruments. So hence we're yeah, going no, I just want to put it out part. there. Yeah. Like I think sometimes, cause I'm so, I love vibrators and I love toys. And I talk about them a lot. I think some people feel like, does that mean I can't have fun without one? And not at all, you know, not at all. And of course, Lisa, we can also use the same clitoral stimulator on different parts of the body because I know that the nipples, for instance, are a really sensitive area for most women. And I think that this little buzzy um, gadget does beautifully on the nipples as well. Yeah, it can be fun. Um, I mean, I think, you know, your body is a wonderland, <laughs> as that song goes, and go forth and explore. I think the only pleasure product, uh, or one of the few that needs a little caveat or, or rather not pleasure product the part of the body that many people don't know enough about because you do need to be careful with what you put inside um is if you're exploring anything with the anal region unlike the vaginal canal which has uh you know you, some something can't get lost inside your vagina because the cervix will not let something go further um with any kind of anal toys it's very very important that the toy has a flared base. So you don't want to be using a toy that isn't intended for anal play or even some sort of household object, I don't know, um, in the anal region because it can be um, sucked into the, you know, it can, it can get lost inside you. So I know that sounds scary, but many people don't know this. So you don't want to be putting just anything. Um, you, need, you need for the you know, something like a butt plug or a prostate massager or all whatever. There's a whole assortment of products available for anal play. And it's important to note that all of them have flared bases because the product is designed such that it cannot get lost, cannot go completely inside you. So that's just something to remember. And also, I think from a safety perspective, it's important to note that, you know, if you're using toys in one region and moving to another, you should sterilize, clean the toy before, for example, switching between anal and vaginal play or also if you're I have multiple partners or have two partners of the same um, sex or whatever it is and you're sharing toys it's also just good you know you can use a condom on a toy um, things like that it's good to consider think of safety um, even when you're using toys just like you would during sex because they are going in especially insertable toys um, and yeah, I mean, I, I think also it's... want to add over here mm -hmm. that, you know, for people who are using something like this for the first time, women who are wanting to use this for the first time with insertable toys, particularly if they're battery operated and they're the lovely vibrating buzzy kind, you may not want to necessarily insert it. You could also put it between your legs and just close your legs around it, your upper thighs. And, you know, that also will give you some kind of starting point. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Honestly, there's so much that is going to just be subjective to how you like things. Some people even find that the vibration, the intensity of, a vib of the vibration of a, something like a clitoral simulator is too much for them. And so they might use it over their underwear or clothing, as opposed to directly on the genitals. Or, you know, you could use, I mean, any vibrating object could be used anywhere on, on the body. And often these products are sold on online marketplaces and things with euphemisms, just like massager, you know? Um, and, and to some extent it is a massager. I mean, if you like how it feels on your shoulder blade or anywhere else, I don't know, it's your scrotum, who knows? Um, you're free to use it that way, you know? I mean, I feel like there's no one to tell you what you can't do with these things other than from a safety perspective, like what I explained about the butt plugs and things. There is no real rule book for where like, you could be anybody of any gender and have fun with an assortment of toys. I think we're too prescriptive in the catalogs of these toys that this is only for women and this is only for men. And this is only, you know, the gender identities exist beyond the binary and everybody with a vulva might not identify as a woman. And I mean, I feel like we need I think that's to probably just open a our minds to, thing, to be able to, to sell more. Exactly. Yeah, it, that's just marketing thing. So you can sell more products because, you know, if you say, well, this is for women and this is for men, then you know that people are buying two separate. I mean, things. I think like also the society tends to be so binary in its viewing of gender that that is, and just ends up being how people see the whole world, right? Think women and men. But I think it's nice to move beyond that. And now there's so many gender neutral toys available as well. I hope they become more easily available in India. But And they have like nothing phallic about... I mean, I think what's nice is that sex tech has really evolved um, such that these objects are not funny and crude looking. They're actually quite beautiful. And like the design and the aesthetics of the product make them a pleasure to, to just behold and use 
the way you would like to use any beautiful, nice thing, you know, that you can, that's a certain pleasure to using any object of beauty, right? Even a beautiful pen or paintbrush can be so much of a pleasure to, to draw with or write with. And similarly, it can be just a nice, wonderful thing. I, I, I agree it's an, it can seem extravagant or something. Sometimes they're really expensive, especially here. And I, I think they deserve to be some, I mean, everybody it wished that they would be as, you know, ubiquitous as toothbrushes or whatever other everyday pro wellness product that we um, might use. So I hope to see that day instead of it seeming like this indulgence item or some sort of like thing for rich people or, you know, I, I think it deserves to be a very democratic and accessible tool because everyone deserves pleasure, everyone. So tell me just to sort of uh, wind up the uh, the conversation, how does one, you, you're talking about what you can buy here, meaning in India, is it not illegal to have sex toys? Isn't the sex toy trade in India illegal? No, it's not illegal. Uh, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding around this because it is a kind of nebulous and complicated um, arena in terms of what the law says. So actually there's no nothing that says sex toys are illegal as far as I understand. I am not a lawyer, but I mean, as you know, there are a huge number of retailers, I mean, like it's not just one there's you know 10 or 15 or 20 or maybe more um selling sex toys online in india already so it isn't illegal to sell sex toys per se it's just that we have this obscenity law um which is very subjective in its application so what one person considers obscene might be very different from what another person considers obscene but in general for example um I think most of the toys that are retailed here, you will not see nudity on the packaging, for example. Um, they might be called massagers or, you know, pleasure, something a little bit more euphemistic than very explicit description of what genital it's supposed to be used on and things like that. But I mean, even very mainstream companies, like the types of condom brands, I don't want to name brands in this podcast because this is not what the podcast is about, but just I'm sure people will know what I'm talking about. Very mainstream, like very, very, readily available mask brands that are available at our chemists that sell condoms also make like vibrating penis rings uh, and things like that. And they're available today at the chemist. You can, they're like in full view. Um, and that is a form of sex toy actually, mm. right? Lube is also readily available, but the more com, I mean, the, the, the sort of foreign brands that have this cult status in other, you know, in other sex positive spaces globally and stuff with the award-winning brands for the R&D and design that they've made. It's harder to get that here, but there are places where you can even get that here. Unfortunately, you're paying a premium because of the import and customs and stuff. But no, it's not illegal. Um, I think that it can just be difficult sometimes to buy uh, pleasure products from, from websites that are headquartered in other countries that have to ship to India, partly because you have to do like this whole customs declaration type of thing when you receive a product from abroad and you have to declare what it is. And at the discretion of that customs officer, you may or may not get your product. Does he think it's obscene or does she think, or do they think it's obscene or not? You know, so you might get your product. I mean, I've received several products that I've ordered from international websites with no problem at all. But if it looks very much like a dismembered genital, it might be confiscated at customs. So it's this very gray area uh, in terms of the application of the obscenity law. It isn't actually a black and white, this is illegal, you know? And that's how so many retailers are selling here. I mean, at this point, even on the, again, I don't want to name brands, but like think of the globally most prominent e-commerce marketplace uh, run by a man called Jeff, they're available there. So <laughs> look up Massager, you know? Look up Massager. Is that what they generally go under? I mean, there's all kinds of things. Even if you actually, if you look up vibrator, it'll take you to that. But often the retailer is calling it a body massager, or women's massager, or pleasure massager, or something like that. You know, but um, it describes the, what it's... In the very early 1900s, when they started in the West selling um, vibrators and so on, they used to be marketed under household appliances with vacuum cleaners. Exactly. I know that. Um, Lisa, do we have any golden rules for potential instrument owners? So I would say first, if you haven't already, first just take a look at your own vulva, take a close look, figure out what is what, explore the region yourself before you even acquire a toy, see what feels nice, what doesn't, um, you know, what kind of 
stimulation you like, what intensity of stimulation you like. I feel like just that can take like a few weeks or months. So, I mean, it's a journey. It's not a, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Um, but I would say it's very worth your while to, if you're interested in exploring this stuff, to spend some time first, just really getting to know your own body and pleasure. And then once you're familiar with um, sort of what, you do like, I think, or even in tandem, perhaps you can, it depends. I, I just meant to say there's so much you can do before even acquiring your pleasure product that might make your selection more uh, satisfying. And so when you look up the array of things available, it can be helpful to kind of figure out how the device works. There's often there's really wonderful, like little videos of the product's features. They're not explicit. They're just like, you know, any kind of technological device review kind of video where you're seeing what each button does or the kind of with illustrations and graphics and things like that can be worth looking at that stuff because these products are quite expensive reading reviews people have really honest like long reviews about which toy they like and things like that I think it can be quite helpful so do your research and then I would say go for the best you can afford because it is a product that might be going inside you um, you know you want to make sure it's a body safe material I would say um, for motorized toys, silicone is far superior to plastic, for example. And with non-motorized toys, you want to make sure that the stainless steel or glass or whatever other, or if it's silicone as well, making sure that it's body safe. Ideally, you know, there's a lot of information about different brands and the really well-known brands uh, have established quality and things like that. So it can be helpful to just do that homework. Um, and I think that when you buy a toy, it can also be helpful to buy some lube, maybe buy a sex toy cleaner if you like, although even just soap like and a good antibacterial soap and warm water does the job of cleaning your toys. It's good to keep them really hygienic. Um, and yeah, I think then go have fun, then get some more toys. <laughs> the learning and the pleasure can be ongoing and infinite. And it should be ongoing and infinite. I mean, why put a why put a moratorium on how much pleasure you can have, right? Exactly, exactly, exactly. And um, as we said earlier, I would sort of like to reiterate this: that you don't always have to insert the sex toy into you. So, for all of you who've written in to say, how do you use it? How do you explore your own pleasure? How do you get around to understanding more about sex toys? If you manage to get one and you want to try using it, either, as Lisa said, you want to use something that's stainless steel, you could put it into cold water or hot water and then put it against different parts of your body to see how the temperatures feel. If it's a motorized one, again, put it on other parts of your body, see how it feels. Put it um, you know, into the crook of your elbow, put it into the crook of your knee at the back. I, that's a particularly nice area for me, I have to say, the back of my knee. There are just lots of spaces on your body that you can try it. Don't rush into anything. And remember that the whole idea, as Lisa started off by saying, it's about playing. It's about having fun. It's about pleasure. It's about joyousness. The point is that you're exploring something that will give you a great deal of pleasure. Not and it's pain, yours to not explore. Unhappiness. Yeah, and it's yours to explore. Yeah. It's your body. I feel like we don't it's... have this message enough that it's out. This is my body. Why can't you know? I have autonomy and agency over this body. I feel like as a as a woman, you don't get that message enough. It's as if you exist only for other people's pleasure, not just sexual. But you know, you're constantly like you eat after everyone else, and you make everyone else tea first, and you're always smiling. You put your needs and your agency last. I feel, especially in South Asia, where like conditioned to behave like this as if this is not really my body and I just exist to please other people you know and so I feel like it's so empowering to pursue your own pleasure in this very direct way <laughs> sorry for interrupting no Lisa I'm really happy that you said it because I was about to say that and I think you just put that put that across really well we do always put ourselves last and certainly when it comes to pleasure because I guess it's an age-old narrative it's a millennial narrative that a woman's pleasure is not of any importance. And I think that's what we are between us trying to change. So I really hope that everybody's gonna take something away from this chat and something that'll add to their lives. And for everybody out there, if you've enjoyed listening to us, please do like, comment, subscribe. We always love hearing from you. And certainly if it's people coming back and saying that uh, they're gonna put this to good use, we like hearing those comments even more. Don't we, Lisa? 
Absolutely. Yes, here's to more pleasure for everyone. Let there always be pleasure. Um, I am, as you all know, on info.seema.anand.gmail.com. I'm here for your questions, so please do write in. And if you want to connect with Lisa, she is on Instagram under Lisa Mangaldas. Not difficult to find her at all, and um, that's the best place to get in touch with her. In the meantime, stay safe, stay well, and we'll see you over here very soon again.